Hey guys, chapter five, uh, probability, and this time it's conditional probability and the general multiplication rule. So a conditional probability, so the notation is gonna be F given E. So the probability of F, this line through it, mean, meaning given and E. So probability of F given E, um, it's a probability that the event F occurs given that event E has occurred. All right, suppose a single die is rolled. What is the probability that the die comes up three? Now suppose that the die is rolled a second time, but we are told that the outcome will be an odd number. That is a probability that the die comes up three. So we're kind of looking into the future and saying that it's going to be um, a three. So the first roll has a probability of being any number, so one through six. Um, so one, a three would be one out of six. But for that second roll, we're given that it's going to be an odd number. So it's going to either be one, three, or five. And with that, the outcome ends up being one third. So the probability of the second roll, because it is an odd number, because we were told it was going to be an odd number, it has a one out of three chance of being, of being an odd number or being a three. So notice that the conditional probability reduces the size of the sample space under consideration. So from six outcomes to three outcomes. So now with the conditional probability, we have if E and F are any two events, then the probability of F given E is equal to the probability of E and F divided by the probability of E or the probability or the number of ways that we could get E and F divided by the number of ways that we could get the probability, probability of E. And the probability of event F occurring given the occurrence of event E is found by dividing the probability of F or the probability of E and F by the probability of F. Uh, by the probability of E or by dividing by the number of outcomes in E and F by the number of outcomes in E. All right, so looking at this, so the data table or the data in table eight represents the marital status and gender of the residents of the United States aged 15 and older. All right, so this looks really familiar. We had this, I believe, in the first section of chapter five or maybe second section, but this right here is... Um, in males and females, and then the total number for each of these categories. And same thing here. So either never married, married, widow, divorced, or separated. Then males that were never married, females that are widowed, and then the total of separated. So we have totals and totals. So that when we add all of these down here, it ends up being the 260.1. And when we add these two here, and it's it also ends up being 260.1 because in both of those, we ended up adding the exact same data here. Okay, so now that we have that, actually let's grab this and take it over to Excel. All right. And let's get a new page. So insert data from picture. Move down to my screenshots. And there we go. Let's make sure that we have everything correct. And it looks good to me. And just so we could see the difference, let's make these bold. So totals here are bold, perfect. And now that we have that, now we have all of our data here, let's... Um, work on these problems. Okay, so compute the probability that a randomly selected individual has never married, given that the individual is married or is male. So what we're looking for is, let's abbreviate it a little bit. So compute the probability that the randomly selected individual has never married. So never married. Given that the individual is male. So even though it's written um, one right after another, let's 
And let's do two more. Oh, I don't know. We could. Oh, okay. Anyway, so we have this probability of never married given that the person is male. So starting off with that, what we could do is first highlight male. And let's get the lighter color. There we go. So probability of male first, and then given that they're male, we highlight male first, then we look at never married. So never married are these. So these divided by those. So again, the probability of never married given that they're male is equal to the probability of never married and male. So never married and male divided by the probability of male. So now here, we could say that the probability of never married given male So never married given male. Let's see if I could actually make this fit. Uh, no, okay. So probability of never married given male. We're looking at the probability of never married and male. So never married and male. So never married and male making this one the overlap. Again, never married and male is this one here divided by all male. And there we go. So again, probability of never married and male is um, the probability of never married and male divided by the probability of male. And that's how we do these contingency tables. And let's see if we miss anything. All right, so substituting it into the formula, we have the probability of married given male. So the probability of, or the number of male and never married divided by the number of males. So we ended up getting 0 0.362, which is what we got here, yay. All right, so the probability that a randomly selected individual has never been married given that the individual is male is 0 0.362. Next, compute the probability that a randomly selected individual is male given the individual has never married. All right, so now substituting it into the formula, we have the probability of male this time given never married. So male given never married is gonna be the exact opposite. So here this time what we're looking at is the opposite of this. Uh, let's not do that, okay. So probability of this time male given never married. There we go. I think I might have fixed it, probably not. All right, so for this one, We'll just say equals this. So this one was the probability of never married and male divided by the probability of male. This one is going to be equal to the probability of male and never married. So still the same one, but this time we're dividing it by never married, this one. And there we go. So there's a different probability. It's all given different things though. So this one, what we did is we first looked at all the males. So all the males first, then look for never married. For this one, what we did is look for never married first. And then we looked at all the, the males of this category. So if you want to imagine something, we could imagine all these males and females in these rooms, in a big, huge room. And for this one here, we first say like, what, um, 
raise your hand if you're married or raise your hand if you're male. And then all these people in this category raise their hand. And then they said, okay, everyone out, or I'm sorry, raise your hand if you're a male. So all of these people raise their hands, everyone else is kicked out. So we could just ignore um, the rest of this data for right now. So we could ignore that data. And of these people, how many of you guys are never married? And then these people rose their hand. And that's how we ended up with these probabilities. So given that they were male first, then we looked at this then found this probability. So if you look at it the opposite way, in this problem, what they did is, let's make this one normal. All right, so now for this one, they said, raise your hand if you've never been married. So all of these people raise their hands, which means that the rest of this data, um, we could kind of care less about. So based on these people, if you were never married, how many of you are male? Because in this room, we still have males and females. So of all these people, how many of you guys were never married? So that's where we got this number, still the exact same number, but a different probability, because this time we were looking at the people that were first never married, and then asked if they were male or female. And so that's how we ended up with these numbers here. And that's about it. All right, so from here, they looked at this different prob uh, probability. So this one's closer to like 50%. So the probability that a randomly selected individual is male, given that the individual has never married, this one is 0 0.534%. All right, so now looking at something totally different. Um, suppose that 12.7% of all births are preterm and the gestation period of a pregnancy is less than 38 or 37 weeks. So also, or um, a baby that's born preterm is less than 37 weeks. Also 0.22% of all births resulted in a preterm baby who weighed eight pounds, 13 ounces or more. What is the probability that a randomly selected baby weighs eight pounds, 13 ounces or more, given that the baby is a preterm baby? Is this unusual? All right, so let's grab all the data first. So the, suppose that 12.7% of all births are preterm. So now we're looking at probability of preterm. So probability of preterm is 12.7%. And then they define what preterm means. Also, 0.22% of all births result in a preterm baby who weighs eight pounds, 13 ounces. So uh, let's see, how did they state this? So 0.22% of all births resulted in a preterm baby who weighed eight pounds, 13 ounces. So here it looks like we're looking at preterm. And eight pounds, 13 ounces, I'm just going to put 8.13. 8.13 or more, that looks like a B. What is the probability um, that a randomly selected baby weighs eight pounds, 13 ounces or more, given that the baby is preterm? So probability of 8.13 or more, given that the baby is preterm. So now 8.13 given that it's preterm. So what we're going to look for is probability of um, 8.13 and preterm. And we're dividing that by probability of preterm. And let's take this over to Excel, see if they could help us. All right, so one more time, we have probability of 
of preterm. And that was 12.7%, but turning 12.7% into a decimal, that is 0 0.12.7. Zero point one two seven, and now we have probability of preterm and eight pounds thirteen ounces. There we go. So that was. Oh, I didn't write it down. So eight pounds, 13 ounces, and preterm, that was 0.22%. So over here, this is 0.22%, which tells us that it's gonna be 0 0.0022 for the decimal. And that's preterm and 13.8. Um, so here, what we're looking at, the probability that we're trying to find is probability of 13.8 and more, given that the baby was preterm. So now what we have is probability of 18.3 and preterm. So notice that these two are two independent events. So when we look at the product or when we look at this probability, it could be either 18.13 or 8.3, uh, this number, 8.13 and preterm, or we could read it as preterm and 8.13. So looking at this, these two are exactly the same. So this is going to be equal to this value divided by this value. And there we go. So it's 0 0.01732 or um, less than 2%. So let's see what Excel tells us. Is this unusual? Yeah, it's pretty unusual. All right, so 0 0.0173, 0 0.0173, that's what we ended up getting. So if 1,000 or if 100 preterm babies were randomly selected, we would expect about two of them to weigh eight pounds, 13 ounces or more. So this would be an unusual outcome. So an eight pound baby, that's a preterm. That is pretty unusual. All right, next compute probability is using the general multiplication rule. So now the general multiplication rule is this right here. So the probability that two events E and F both occur is the probability of event E and F equaling the probability of event E times the probability of event F given E. So this happens with um, dependent events, or yeah, dependent events happening. If it were an independent event happening, then this would just be the probability of F happening. Um, so in other words, the probability of event E and F is the probability of event E occurring times the probability of event F occurring given the occurrence of event E. All right, so the probability that a driver who is speeding gets pulled over is 0.8 probability that a driver gets a ticket given that he or she is pulled over is 0 0.9. What is the probability that a randomly selected driver who speeds gets pulled over and gets a ticket? All right, so probability that a driver speeds and gets pulled over. So probability of speed and pulled over. That's 0 0.8. The probability that a driver gets a ticket given that he or she was speeding. So probability of ticket given speeding. Given speeding and pulled over. That is 0 0.9. What is the probability that a randomly selected driver who is speeding gets pulled over and gets a ticket? So again, what we're looking at is probability, um, probability of speeding, 
speeding. Speeding and ticket. Or speeding, pulled over, and ticket. So we could just say speed and pulled. And and ticket. All right, so looking at this, um, what we're looking at is the formula exactly. So we have an event and an event. So probability of speeding pull over, speed, speeding and being pulled over and ticket. So here we're looking at the probability of speeding and getting pulled over. So speed and pulled. And we're multiplying that by the probability of getting a ticket given that you were speeding and got pulled over. All right, taking this over to Excel. So again, uh, let's zoom in a little bit. So probability of speeding and getting pulled over. So that's 0 0.8. Next one is um, probability of getting a ticket given that you were speeding and got pulled over. All right, so this was 0 0.9. And now what we want is a probability of speeding and pulled over and ticket. So probability of speeding and pulled over. and ticket. So this is the end meaning product. So here we're getting the product of the two. So equals um, probability of speeding and pulled over times the probability of getting a ticket given that you were speeding and got pulled over. So 0 0.72 and that should be our probability. Zero point seven two, perfect. So the probability that a driver who is speeding gets pulled over and gets a ticket is zero point seven two. Um, that was just a little confusing because part of the first probability threw a an and in there. Um, okay, so now with this, suppose that one hundred circuits sent to a manufacturer plant. Five are defective. The plant manager receiving these circuits randomly selects two and tests them. So if both circuits work, she will accept the shipment. Otherwise, the shipment is rejected. What is the probability that the plant manager discovers at least one defective circuit and rejects the shipment? All right, so looking at this, suppose that of 100 circuits sent to a manufacturer, five are defective. So let's look at that probability. So probability of um, defective. So this is kind of grabbing a lot of different probabilities. So probability of defective is there are five defective out of the entire 100. The plan manager receiving circuits randomly selects two and tests them. If both circuits work, she will accept the shipment. Otherwise, the shipment is rejected. So it is a probability. Um, so if both circuits work, she'll accept it. Otherwise, the shipment is rejected. So we're looking at probability of rejection. 
So probability of rejection. And let's see, otherwise the shipment is rejected. What is the probability that the plant manager discovers at least one defective? So that's actually what we're looking for. So probability of at least one defective. All right, let's take this over to Excel. Okay, oh, let's get another page. Okay, so uh, let's think about how we could do this. So at least one defective out of the two. Mm, let's write that down out of two. So let's kind of, I feel like there's two different approaches that we could take on this. And the first one is going to be us writing down all the different possibilities of finding a defective one. So the first one is going to be, um, we have either, um, we'll say like good and bad. And D for defective. So GERD versus defective. So the different possibilities for um, us selecting two different ones, we have both of them are good. We have the first one defective, second one good, first one good, second one defective. And um, lastly, we have both of them defective. All right, so if we look at this here, that constitutes um, us accepting it, right? And if we look at this one here, it represents us rejecting the batch, rejecting the batch and rejecting the batch for all of these. All right, so now we just have to look at those probabilities. So we could either have, um, could we do a complement rule? Yep, looks like we could do a complement rule. So we could say the probability, um, let's write it in a different color so we know exactly what we're talking about. So we could say probability of at least one defective one defective that's equal to one minus the probability of two good ones. All right, so right now we can look at the probability of defective. So probability of defective, this is equal to five out of the 100 because there's five defective ones out of 100. So that's 0 0.05. Um, but we could look at the probability of good. So probability of good, that's equal to the complement. So one minus 0 0.05. So 95. So now looking at this here, the probability of at least one defective. So at least one defective, that's equal to one minus the probability of two good ones. So one minus this raised to the power two. Um, there we go, so 0 0.9. Seven five, and we could go back and see what they how they ended up doing it. So we could have done this. We could have found each of these probabilities and then added these three up together to see what the probability of getting one of those and the probability of rejection would have been that number. So probability of rejection is this here. Let's clear this out. And from here, let's see what they did. So of the 100 circuits, five are defective, 95 are not defective. So 95 of them are good. So approach one, construct a tree diagram to determine the possible outcomes for the experiment. So um, this is what they ended up doing. So because the outcomes are not equally likely, we conclude the probability in our diagram to show the probability of each outcome 
is obtained by multiplying the individual probabilities along with the corresponding path. All right, so what they did is they did the same thing we did, good, 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 bad, um, bad, good, bad, bad. So looking at all of these different probabilities, when we add all of them up together, we end up with 100% because we have all those different possibilities. Um, let's see. Here they could have just gone with this and said probability of, or like the complement here, but they ended up adding these three together because if they add these three together and the way that they ended up doing these is with the given probability. So the first one is good. So probability of good times the probability of defective given that the first one's good. So remember probability, these probabilities end up changing because here we no longer have 100 to choose from because we chose a good one over here, we chose um, a different one over here. So this one has, instead of 100 chances or 100 different possibilities, we now have 99 because we chose one over here. And you see that with all of these. So 100, so out of 100, this one's out of 99 because we chose one something over here. And with both of them being good, there were originally 95 good, 94 good because we chose one good one here. So same thing happened there. And similarly, same thing happened over here too. So of the 100, we had five bad ones. So if we had a bad one in the first one, we have um, we now have one less bad one for the second one. So that's why we ended up with four here and 99 here. So kind of cool there. All right, so what they did here, at least one defective. So they added those three probabilities up together. So the probability of the first one being good, second one being bad. The first one being bad, second one being good, and the last one was both of them being bad, and we ended up with 0 0.098. But what we did is we took the second approach, compute the probability that both circuits are not defective, and use a complement rule to determine the probability of at least one defective. So now probabil probability of at least one defective is exactly what we did. So, ooh. I messed up over here. So it isn't exactly that. So I should have noticed it. Okay, so here is what happened. So very similarly, we have these over here, but these aren't correct. So we have the probability of a defective one and the probability of a good one. So now what we do is um, uh, we said here, so we said the probability of at least one defective was equal to the probability, do I still have it here? Yes. So I said that the probability of one defective is a probability that both of them are good. So these are not independent events, so we couldn't follow this this way. So what we have to do is say that this is one minus the probability of two good ones. So two good ones, which that ends up changing a little bit. So probability of two good ones, that's supposed to be a G. So two good ones. So that's the probability of good and good. But here the probability of both of them being good is just a little bit different. We're looking at the probability of good times the probability of good given good. So the first one, the probability of good, we did say that there were 90, what was it? 95 good ones. So 95 out of the 100 good ones. But if we select the first one and it's good, we select the second one. Now we took one away from the good pile. So now instead of 95, we only have 94 good ones. Instead of 100 good ones, we now have 99 good ones. So then this is a product that we're looking at. So now the probability of two good um, circuits, this is equal to the probability of 95 divided by 100 times 94 divided by 99. And that's what this value is here. 
So now the at least probability, so probability of at least one defective is equal to one minus the probability of two good circuits. So one minus the probability of two good circuits. And that does change that 0 0.0979, so 0 0.98. And that's what they have here, 0 0.98. So my apologies for that last one. Um, and we can move on. So again, whenever we're looking at these probabilities, we have to make sure that we remember that last step. So if, what, if the probability of one affects the next one, then it, it's a different probability. It's not just raised to the power anymore. Okay, in a study to determine whether the preferences for self are more or less um, pro uh, prevalent, sorry, um, I'm sorry, prevalent. So more or less prevalent than preferences for the other researchers first asked individuals to identify the person who is most valuable and likable to you or your favor to the other. Of the 1,519 individuals surveyed, 49 had chosen themselves as their favorite other. All right, so that's what we have here. So one more time. So probability of choosing self is equal to 42 out of the 15, 19 people. All right, so the question here is, suppose we randomly select one of the 15, 19 people, 15, 1519 individuals survey, what is the probability that he or she chose himself or herself as their favorite person? So randomly selecting one person, we just have to find the probability of self. And that's 42 out of 151.9. And all we have to do is plug it into here. Oh. All right, so equal to probability, so probability of self. That's 42 out of 15, 19, oh, equal to. Ah, much better. So 0 0.27649, so or 27, 0 0.0276. 0 0.0276, perfect. All right, so if two individuals from this group are randomly selected, what is the probability that both chose themselves as their favorite other? <clears throat> All right, so now probability, this one changes a little bit. So if two individuals from this group are randomly selected, what is the probability that both chose themselves as their favorite? Probability of two self. So that's equal to the probability of um, self and self. And remember, this is not, um, it's not independent. So if it were independent, we would grab that first person, ask them self or someone else, and they would say self. And um, us putting them back into the running to randomly to be randomly selected again, that would make it an independent event. But these two are dependent. So because once we ask the first person, we can't ask that first person again, we have to ask another person. So here, what we're looking at is probability of self times the probability of self, given that the first person said self. So this one, we had said 42 out of 1519. So that's a probability of self. But now of those people, we chose one out of those 42 people. So we have to take one out. So that's 41. And then same thing of the 15, 19 people. 
So 15, 19 people in total, since we took one out, now it's 15, 18. So here, this is equal to our probability of self of two self. So that's equal to 42 out of the 15, 19 times 41 out of 15, 18. And this one's a little bit more rare. So this one's going to be equal to 0 0.0007468. Seven, four, six, eight, perfect. That's what we ended up getting. So again, we had the first event and the first event was that they chose themselves, which was a 42 out of 50, 15, 19. And now the second event was um, probability of choosing self given that the first person already chose themselves. So that's where the 41 came from. One less than 42 because we chose one person that chose themselves in this first one and one person from the entire group. So that's why that one's one less as well. And lastly, compute the probability of randomly selecting two individuals from this group who selected themselves as their favorite person, assuming independence. So again, assuming independence, what that's telling us is these people um, from this group of 1,519 people, they picked this person that said self, Self, and then they had a bunch of other people over here. Some of them said self, some of them said others. They grabbed this person, they said, who you pick? I pick self. And once they answered, they grabbed them and put them right back into the, into the pool. So for the second group, we're able to show, um, like we're able to choose them again. They have a, a ran there. They have a chance to be randomly selected a second time. So that's what independence means in this case. So again, probability of self are two people that chose themselves. So two self. So this time it's equal to the 42 out of 15, 19 times again, 42 out of 15, 19. And again, independence, because they're saying that once they selected that person, they were able to throw that person back into the running. And let's see what this ends up being. So equal to, so equal to 42 out of 15, 19 times 42 out of 15, 19. And this one's very similar. So you could see that it's kind of similar to what we have up here, but not exactly. So this one ended up being 0 0.0007645. And five. so this was seven, seven, four, six, eight. This one's seven, six, four, five. And let's see what we have here. So here we have the probability of one or the probability of the first event equal to the probability of the second event. So when we multiply them, we ended up with the seven, four, six, or seven, six, four, five, instead of the seven, four, six, eight, something along those lines. So very similar, but not exactly. All right, and that's the end of five point, I believe four. Yeah, 5.4. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Please email me. This is a pretty tricky um, section, but it's I still believe it's one of the most fun sections that we have here. Again, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, good luck. Bye.